happy Easter. Christ is risen. Welcome to Beverly Baptist Church. My name's Alison and I'm a member of the church and on the leadership team and I'll be leading our service this morning. And welcome to everyone, whether you're a regular member of our congregation, whether you are an old friend who's joining us or whether you are, are somebody who's found us on the internet or has been told about us. Everybody is welcome. Before we begin our service properly this morning, I would like to remind everybody that we will be celebrating communion this morning. Obviously, we can't do this together physically as we would do normally, but we can be together as the body of Christ. Therefore, if you haven't already done this, we would recommend that you get some bread and, or biscuit to use or and some wine or some juice or anything. It doesn't really matter. When I lived in rural East Africa, I was once uh, given communion with Pepsi because it was the only safe drink around. So it doesn't really matter what you use. We will be celebrating communion in about 10 minutes time so you've got a little bit of time to do that. So let's begin our service. Easter celebrates Jesus rising from the dead so let's begin with the ancient Easter greeting. I will say Christ is risen and you rep reply he is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And I'm now going to hand over to Naomi, who is going to lead the music. And let's celebrate this special day by singing. Hello, everybody. We'll start our worship today with He Has Risen.
see what a morning. this week other than to encourage everyone to keep in touch. If you attend BBC you will receive our notice sheet buzz each week which gives details of the different online meetings and prayer opportunities etc. There are also whatsapp groups for families and for house groups. There are emailed Sunday school activities for the children and if you're ill or you have to self-isolate or you have any other needs, please do let us know via the church email address so we can support you in whatever way, including prayer and also in practical ways. As you know, we love to celebrate birthdays and anniversaries and other good things in our church family life with the gift of a crunchy. And during these strange times, when we can't physically meet. Our crunchy fairies have been busy and they would love to use their exercise time 
to deliver you your country if you're celebrating something. And as someone who received a country a couple of weeks ago, I know that they do it very well. Please make sure that you let Emily know in advance. People who celebrate their birthdays, who I've been told about, are Lydia and Ruth, Philip and Karen, and we hope that they have a very happy day. And Emma and Kev are celebrating their first wedding anniversary tomorrow, Monday the 13th. And we hope that they too are going to be able to celebrate together, despite these strange times. And now we come to our reading, which is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 15, verse 42 to 16, verse 8. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So, as the evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the cloth and laid it in a tomb cut out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee, there you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone, because they were afraid. Now. Today's Easter Sunday, which is a really important time, probably the most important day of the uh, church calendar for us as Christians. So what does the word Easter actually mean to you? What different words does it conjure in your mind if I say the word Easter? It might be chocolate, it might be Jesus, it might be bunnies or spring. There are all sorts of different things. So have a little think and make a list. If you're with other people, you might like to share some of these ideas and you might like to share them on WhatsApp. If you're in a house group or the family group, you might like to uh, send a message to the rest of your group with some of the words which you think about and are associated with Easter. I hope that you enjoyed doing that activity and that you were blessed by some of the suggestions which you had and that other people may have had. And you'll see on a slide some of the things which I thought about when I was doing this activity. We're now going to move into a time of communion to remember our Lord's death on the cross for us and his resurrection. It's open to anyone 
who loves and knows the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to settle our hearts and our minds and remember what Easter is all, really all about by singing Behold the Lamb. Remember
God asks that we come to this table with clean hands and a clean heart. Let's silently confess those things which we have thought and said and done which have not been pleasing to God. St Paul says, this saying is true and worthy of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you for the truth of these words. We pray that you will accept the confession of our hearts and forgive us. Help us to live in a way which is worthy of you. In Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to share in the bread and the wine together as the body of Christ, even though we are physically apart, let's acknowledge the great honour and privilege we have of being able to do this together because of what Jesus has done for us. The Anglican Prayer of Humble Access says, we do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercy, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are same Lord, whose nature is always have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so we eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body and our souls washed through his most precious blood that, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. St Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I would invite you to take, your, take and eat your bread as a symbol of Jesus' body broken for you. to drink the wine or the juice or whatever you have as a symbol of Jesus' blood being shed for you. And let's pray. Father of all, we give you thanks that we praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, he gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope that you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free. And the whole world live to praise your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the children might like to begin to do the activities which have been emailed to them if they haven't already done that. 
and we'd love to see what you've done so please do share it on the family's whatsapp group and we're going to have a time of worship now there will be a short pause between each song for you to express your own praise and thanks to god for the gift of his son dying on the cross and his resurrection let's come together and sing oh praise the lord to God.
time for a time of prayer. There's so much going on in our world and our country at the moment with the current pandemic and all its implications and the impacts on every part of our lives. Let's spend a couple of minutes in prayer, praying to our Heavenly Father for whatever is on your heart, whether silently or out loud, the Lord hears. Father God, on this Easter Sunday, hear our prayer. Phil, our minister, is going to come and preach to us now. Let's pray for him first. Father God, thank you for Phil and for all the preparation which he's put into this sermon. Please use his words and speak to us about the wonders of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. The Guardian this week had an article where they asked authors to recommend uplifting books for us to read while on lockdown. I have to say some of the suggestions were more uplifting than others. Some people's response was to recommend things that took us as far away from the current situation as possible. Pure escapism, a different world. Others seem to favour books full of doom and gloom and dysfunctionality and pain, which then had a happy ending. Perhaps in the hope to convey that this too will pass. It was yet another reminder to me that we are all dealing with our current situation in different ways. Recommendations for uplifting reading, I would suggest, would not generally include the final chapters of Mark's Gospel. Those who were in the listening zone for last week's Explore Together service may remember that we talked about Mark's bleak telling of the crucifixion narrative with none of the little positive stories of hope that the other writers give us. And we can explain that to an extent by the fact that Mark's Gospel is the shortest by some way, uh, and that brevity will inevitably lead to the missing out of extra details. Mark is setting down the bare facts in a way that is often stark. There's a sense of just trying to get the details down on the page. And it is crucifixion, after all, it can't be expected to be an uplifting, positive narrative. But we might be a bit more surprised to find a downbeat, negative tone, even when we read Mark's account of the resurrection. Jesus dies on the Friday. He's laid in the tomb. Uh, the next day is the Sabbath, so they rest. And then first thing on the Sunday morning, the women are on their way with the spices to anoint Jesus. It's not a particularly pleasant thing to have to do. I can't imagine they were looking forward to it. There's the physical discomfort of being with a dead body, which would also make them ritually unclean. And of course, this body is a friend, one they loved. And it's not just any dead body. This is not someone who's passed away peacefully in old age in a nice clean hospital. This is one who's been beaten to within an inch of his life. Had nails banged into his limbs, a spear thrust into his side. 
This is a twisted, tortured, broken, bloodied body which they are anticipating. So we can't expect them to be in a place of positivity. But Mark captures their gloom. He alone of the Gospel writers inserts this question, who will roll away the stone? They're already finding problems, potential pitfalls to their mission, reasons things are going to be difficult and might not work as they expect. Of course, when they get there, the stone has been rolled away and they enter and the body has gone and there's an angel who tells them that Jesus has risen and gives them instructions of what to do next. How does that make them feel? What's their response? Well, not for Mark the joy that is expressed in Matthew's Gospel, not the remembrance and the understanding that is found in Luke, not the comforting encounters with the risen Lord that are described by the other Gospel writers. Mark tells us simply, trembling and bewildered. The women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anybody because they were afraid. And that's it. That's the end of Mark's story. This certainly isn't the Disney version. There are no happy endings here. There is fear and confusion and silence. The question of why or even whether Mark ends his gospel like this has been a matter of discussion pretty much since he wrote it. The ending seems abrupt. It actually finishes with the word because, which some have read as it finishing in the middle of a sentence, though actually it's not as strange in Greek as it would be in English, because the because refers back. They said nothing because they were afraid. Recent scholarship has suggested that maybe Mark was intending some clever literary device, seeking to elicit a particular emotional response in his readers. But I think that's probably imposing 20th century reader response theory onto a 1st century author. The assumption for most has been that Mark didn't intend to finish like that, that we've quite simply lost the last page, the original ending. If you have a printed Bible, you will almost certainly have more verses to Mark 16. They might be in italics or square brackets or in some other way indicated as being different. They will be one or, depending on your translation, more than one of the supposed endings to Mark's Gospel, which have floated around since very early on. But the fact is that the very earliest manuscripts of Mark, none of them, contain those endings. Whether or not the writer intended it that way, the earliest Christian scribes were content to copy and distribute Mark's Gospel with its ending in this depressing and uncertain manner at verse 8. And I think it's useful for us in this form. There's things we can take from it. Because there's a sense in which Mark tells it how it was in the moment. With hindsight, certainly for us, knowing much more of the story, but, but actually even for those first disciples, when they'd had a bit of time to reflect on things, for, for things to sink in and to remember some of what Jesus had taught, then there was the joy, the anticipation, the could it really be? that begins to creep in. But in that very first instance, for this group of women already in a fragile mental state, expecting one thing and finding another, having already lost Jesus and now seemingly lost him again, having seen what may be an angel and that generally produces a sense of fear, however much the first words he says are, do not be alarmed. For these women, yes, their first response is likely to be fear, and confusion and bewilderment. We must be careful with our hindsight not to look down on these women for not immediately believing and responding positively to what has happened. Mark gives us a realistic account of how they would have been feeling, how we would have been feeling if we'd been there. If we're honest, 
often how we would be feeling now. Because an encounter with the miracle of resurrection, with the awesome power and unexpected actions of God, can be an unsettling and unnerving experience. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Many of us will know how they felt. I wonder how you responded when you first came to faith in Jesus. When you first encountered his death and resurrection in a way which was real for you. Maybe you were with someone who was talking it through with you. Maybe you responded immediately with delight and ran to tell people like the women in some of the other Gospels. But for many of us, it will have been an unsettling experience. One that we needed time to process. The awesome, almost scary reality of encountering God for the first time. Realising all the implications of that. It was something you needed to keep to yourself while you worked out what it meant. While you thought through how you were reacting. While you decided how you were going to respond. Maybe that took you days, even weeks, to feel confident enough to tell someone else what you had experienced. Maybe you never have. There can be fear and uncertainty. What will they think? Will they believe me? The fear that verbalising this sets you on a path that you can't turn back from. And it's okay to take time to process, to understand what you have experienced. But just as the angel's instruction to these women was go and tell the disciples. And we know from the other Gospels they did eventually testify. And what a great encouragement that was. Keeping those believers believing. At a time when they could so easily have given up. So I would urge you. If you have met with the risen Jesus, please don't keep that to yourself. But it's not just about the first time we meet with Jesus. All of us can have those moments where we encounter what God is doing in a way that flips us upside down. That fills us simultaneously with excitement and terror. And that fear that fear of telling others in case it turns out to have been our imagination. In case they ask us to explain something that we can't. In case they get jealous that they haven't experienced it too. But we must seek to overcome our fear. To testify to those moments in our lives. Even if we don't understand. Even if we can't really explain. To seek as best we're able to bear witness to what seems to us to have happened. Because we do have something to witness to. I don't think Mark was using an intentional literary device. But the seemingly unfinished nature of his gospel allows us, even invites us, to write our own ending. It leaves the women, the church, us, with the uncertainty and the bewilderment and the fear and asks the question, what will you do with this? It's a question for any time, but perhaps particularly pertinent in these days. Because we live in a time when, I think I can safely say, more than any time in my lifetime, probably in any of our lifetimes, we are facing something new and unprecedented and unexpected. 
The women walked through that garden, yes, with questions and concerns. Who will move the stone? But for all that, with a fairly definite plan. To enter the tomb, to prepare Jesus' body for burial as a last act of love and devotion. But then God turns everything upside down. And that's not a comfortable experience. If you can remember back to January the 1st, 2020. Maybe you set New Year's resolutions. Maybe you took the chance to take stock of where you'd come from over the past year and where you might like to go over the next year. Or maybe you simply just had plans and expectations and assumptions of what would happen. Of everyday life such as your job, your hobbies, your kids in school. Or the bigger things, holidays you had planned, friends, weddings, moving house. And suddenly, two and a half weeks ago, an experience akin to those women as they rounded the bend in the garden and the stone was rolled away. Everything was picked up, thrown around and dropped down again in the wrong place. Nothing was as you expected it to be. Now I'm not for one second <coughs> suggesting that God orchestrated all this in order to change things. There are voices out there on social media suggesting that, or more often actually not using the word God, suggesting this is Mother Nature's way of retaliating for how we've treated the planet. I'm sorry, such ideas are crude and offensive. This is not a planned event. God does not actively work to bring evil and destruction in the world. But it has happened. And God is still present in the world in the midst of it. And he will rework things to bring some good out of this situation for his people and for the world. And we, as his people, as the church, will be a significant part of how that will happen. So how do we respond to this unexpected turn of events? Well, it's okay for us to respond like these women to be thrown off course, bewildered, uncertain, questioning, fearful. We are human. I was reading an article this week by a psychiatrist explaining that part of being human is being able to have some control over our lives. Yes, never complete control. But when we find ourselves suddenly feeling that the amount of control we have has rapidly diminished, that there is very little left that we can influence, that is unsettling. And it's okay to want to flee in fear from all that is going on. But we must also hear the voice of God speaking through this. The message that he has for us for us to hear for ourselves and for us to take to the world. And it's the same message as it was for these women. Jesus, who was dead, has risen. Go and tell. Because this is the ultimate message of hope. For all humanity, for all time, including this time. The hope that death is not the end, that disease is not the end, that life is about more than continuing to breathe, that God's ultimate purpose for this creation is renewal and eternal perfection in his presence. The hope that the Jesus who lived and died is alive again and present with us by his spirit. The hope that in the midst of our fear and distress, he will meet with us and bring life and peace. The hope that beyond this hell, there can be paradise. That's the hope that we have this Easter as every Easter.
Could God have prevented coronavirus? If it's a question about his power, then undoubtedly yes. The one who, in the words of the writer to the Hebrews, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, and can equip us with everything good, yes, undoubtedly he has the power to stop this. But to do so would compromise the integrity of the way that he works in this world, where he allows human beings freedom to choose how we live with all the implications of that for us and for all creation. There are undoubtedly instances where God does intervene, but by and large he does not step in and prevent death. He allows it to happen as part of this broken world, as he allowed it to happen to Jesus. And then he steps in and he redeems it, bringing resurrection and hope in its place. So in our current situation, I have no doubt that God's heart breaks as he sees what is happening in the world. I also have no doubt that his desire is to see us restored to life. And not just life as it was before, but life even better than it was before. Just as Jesus' resurrection body was much more than the body that he'd had previously. But we're not there yet. And we won't get there by pretending that we are. The Christian hope is not that we avoid or escape death. It's that as we go through death, it will be followed by resurrection. We can't jump straight to the resurrection without acknowledging the death. And we still have a long and painful road ahead of us. Let's not pretend that isn't the case. Let's not jump ahead of ourselves. Let's allow ourselves the time to process our bewilderment and fear. And let's be careful that we are clear what our hope is. There are no guarantees that physically and economically this country, this world, will rebound quickly, if indeed at all. That depends on our decisions and the decisions of our political leaders over coming days. It may be, and I pray that it isn't, but it may be that we live with the fallout from this, from this death, for years to come. Which is why it's even more important that through our prayers and reflections at this time, we renew our faith in the God who walks with us through death into new life, who experiences with us suffering and despair so that he can bring hope. And inspired and empowered by him, we can articulate and shape that life and that hope in the uncertain future ahead. In these times of uncertainty, and questioning. We are called to be the transmitters of the message of life and hope. A message that started with a small group of women huddled in a tomb in a garden, that spread from there to a a handful of disciples, that over the course of the next six weeks reached maybe a few hundred, and then 3,000 in one day and then spread like wildfire all over the known world. As the spread of coronavirus may, please God, be beginning to slow in this country and in our part of the world. Let us pray that the spread of the hope and good news of the resurrection will continue to grow unstoppably. 
as people continue to face the death of much of what they have known. May we articulate the gospel of a God who walks through that death with us and leads us into the fullness of resurrection life. A life which may look very different from what we had before, but which is fuller and deeper and richer because it is lived in the resurrection power of the Spirit. Let us have the courage to move beyond our fears and to testify to that unchanging and unshakable truth that he is not here, he has risen. And as we do so, may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip us with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Phil, for your sermon. And I'll close in prayer. Father of all, we thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us and for the whole world. We thank you that he rose again and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Please help us to live in the truth of his death and his resurrection and our forgiveness as we go out into the world this coming week with all its strangeness and unknowings at the moment. And help us to know that we go with you. Amen. And Naomi and the group are going to lead us in our final song. We join together in our final song, In Christ Alone.
thank you to Naomi and the group for that song and for all the music this week. And our final blessing, Christ is risen, hallelujah. Let's go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Amen. And that's the end of our service this morning. We hope that you have enjoyed it and that you have known Christ through it. BBC regulars will have received information about joining us via Zoom for our coffee time. That will be starting at half past 11, so make your coffee and come and join us for an informal time of chat if you would like to. For others who are joining us for during this uh, time of isolation, this uh, unusual and strange time, we are delighted to have you with us. As far as possible, we are hoping to keep our usual pattern of services. So if you would like to keep in touch, receive our emailed midweek devotional and know about what the service is going to be for next Sunday and receive emails, activities for children and young people, please email our church office at office at beverlybaptist.com. Have a good week and go with God. <laughs>